you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Dan from the AI for Earth program at Microsoft. I'm in a, I bet most of you can guess that has something to do with AI and something to do with Earth and something to do with Microsoft, but I'm going to tell you what the AI for Earth program actually is. I'm mostly going to tell you about uh, our major project, which is the planetary computer platform for putting geospatial data to work for environmental sustainability. And please do fire away with, I love to be interrupted, but not a lot of slides, fire away with questions if you if you have them either in the chat or just shout out loud. So before we talk planetary computer, let me tell you in just a couple of slides what the AI for Earth program is. Uh, our job is to put the Azure cloud to work for conservation and sustainability. Uh, we basically do that in three different ways, only one of which I'm really going to talk about today. Uh, so we are, a, I'm going to do one slide each on the other ones. So we're a grants program. We give both money and Azure resources away to organizations all over the world uh, working at the intersection of AI and environmental sustainability. Our grants program is also really an education program. Most of our grantees are using the cloud for the first time, and we do not want to just give cloud credits to ecologists and say, have fun, good luck with the Azure portal. So we take our educational responsibility really seriously there too, have all kinds of uh, educational sessions and ways that we engage with our grantees. Uh, we do uh, a bunch of work building machine learning tools to help conservation scientists be more efficient at what they do. We'll talk about that in one slide later. Most of what we do though now, 90% of my job, is the development of a platform we launched in April called the Planetary Computer for uh, analyzing large geospatial data sets on Azure. So like I said, about one slide each on the first two, and then mostly we're going to talk about the Planetary Computer today. Uh, so in terms of our grants program, we have all kinds of different grants. We have 800 or so grantees all over the world. Uh, we have um, our kind of bread and butter grants that are uh, Azure Compute Credit grants that you can find on our webpage. I did want to call out one particular RFP that may be relevant for this audience that just launched last week. This is an RFP we have in collaboration with GEO, uh, specifically focused on uh, remote uh, analyzing remote sensing data for uh, sustainability applications. And this is both a uh, cash grant, Azure credit grant, and recently we announced that this would also provide access. Some of you may be familiar uh, with the program that Planet and the Norwegian Ministry of the Environment launched recently to make uh, high resolution planet mosaics available for sustainability applications. Recipients of awards through this RFP will also have access to that data. So this is a really exciting new opportunity to put both the data we host on the planetary computer and new data from Planet to work for sustainability. So check this out if that sounds like the kind of work that you do. And the last thing I'll say about our grants program is that I wish I could stand here and in the next hour tell you 800 stories about all of our 800 really interesting grantees, but obviously I don't have time to do that. So I encourage you to check out this URL. This is our AI for Earth grantee gallery, KMS AI for E grantees, and you can get a sense of what our grants program is all about and what folks all over the world are doing with machine learning for environmental sustainability. I'm going to say about our grants program, and then I'm going to spend just one slide talking about what is my absolute favorite thing in the world to talk about. So please do feel free to ask questions about this, especially at the end. Like we could talk forever about this. Uh, we do a bunch of work here at Microsoft to put machine learning to work, helping conservation scientists be more efficient. Like while we're sitting here on this call, there are conservation scientists doing really boring things to annotate data all over the world in all kinds of different domains. And there's a huge opportunity to use machine learning to help those folks be more efficient at what they're doing, answer questions faster, and spend their time planning conservation instead of clicking on images. And so we built machine learning tools for uh, biodiversity surveys around uh, camera traps, aerial surveys, uh, and bioacoustic surveys. We've also done some work around accelerating land cover surveys from aerial and satellite imagery. Uh, if you check out the URLs, AKMS land cover mapping, AKMS biodiversity surveys, you can see basically all of this work. It's basically all open source. Um, and though this isn't the focus of my talk today, since uh, it was mentioned that some of you do work in this area, I'm more than happy to talk about this. The camera trap work is my passion and love to talk about that. So we, we could spend the whole hour talking about that. Um, but we can come back to that if folks have questions at the end, because mostly what I want to talk about today uh, is our planetary computer platform. Um, I'll actually pause really quickly for one second. That was my whirlwind tour of everything in AI for Earth that isn't the planetary computer. Any questions about anything I just said before we get dive into planetary computer? Going once. Okay, let's talk planetary computer. Uh, so before I tell you 
what the planetary computer is, I'm going to tell you a little bit about why we are building one. Uh, so I think most of you know that environmental sustainability increasingly depends on very large geospatial data sets, uh, particularly uh, remote sensing data and weather and climate data. And it turns out that working with geospatial data, whether it's big or tiny, is a big pain unless you have lots of experience in GIS or remote sensing. There is a reason that people get degrees in GIS and remote sensing. And it also turns out that working with very large data, whether it's geospatial data or just CSV files, is also a big pain unless you have lots of experience in distributed computing. And again, there's a reason that people get degrees in computer science and distributed computing. Uh, and most of the folks that we work with at the front lines of conservation, unfortunately, usually have neither of the above. Uh, and that is why our planetary computer platform is putting key environmental data sets alongside processing tools and a managed computer environment to hopefully substantially lower or remove that access barrier that separates sustainability practitioners from these really important data sets. And it's why we're working with partners to build applications that put that whole platform to work for environmental decision making. And now I get to tell you what the planetary computer actually is. And I'll go through each of these in a little bit more detail in the next few slides. So the foundation of the planetary computer is a collection of geospatial data currently sitting at about 25 petabytes on Azure. Uh, a set of querying and processing APIs that make it easier to find the data you need in that 25 petabyte catalog. A managed compute environment that we call the planetary computer hub, uh, sp specifically for data science type workflows. And then last but not least, uh, applications built by our partners that put all of those things to work for sustainability. So let's talk a little bit first about our data catalog. There'll be lots of URLs at the bottom if you want to follow along at home. This is not meant to be an exhaustive list of the data we host, but it is meant to communicate the gist of the types of data that we host on Azure via our planetary computer data catalog. So most of the data, if you measure it by bits, is remote sensing data. Uh, then a growing catalog of large weather and climate data sets as well. Uh, and then also a number of data categories that aren't large in the way that remote sensing and climate data are, but are equally important to have co-located with that data for a lot of the kinds of work that our partners do. And that includes in particular land cover and biodiversity data. Uh, and I wanna say a few words about what it means for us to have one of these data sets on Azure. We are working really hard to get all of these data sets into a single Azure data center. They obviously begin life all over the world. Uh, and the vast majority of interesting analyses require more than one of these data sets. And that gets very tricky if your Landsat data is in one continent and your Sentinel data is in another continent. So we're working really hard to get all of this data into a single Azure data center. Uh, we are also working really hard to get all of this data into a consistent set of file formats. As many of you know, this data also begins life in a variety of file formats. And uh, so we want to provide a very consistent experience and a cloud optimized experience working with all of this data so that if you write some code to use our Landsat data, you shouldn't have to write brand new code to work with our Sentinel data. Uh, and so we are working really hard to process this data to a consistent set of file formats and for those of you who are in the remote sensing space, FYI, that's basically COG for all of our remote sensing data and basically czar for all of our weather and climate data. Um, and, uh, and then we are also trying to present what the community considers atmosphere, uh, considers analysis ready data. So for the remote sensing data, that means providing atmospherically corrected data. So for example, for our Sentinel-2 data, we processed all of that to uh, to bottom of the atmosphere data. Uh, we will be terrain correcting all of our Sentinel-1 data so that we can offer a basically analysis ready catalog for all of these data sets. Uh, and I will pause there be before I move on. Any questions about our data catalog? Uh, Dan, I have a question. Which is, uh, you, you mentioned uh, analysis of the data, but uh, eventually, uh, are you planning also to provide, for example, a continental level uh, analysis of the data? So like uh, geocomposites or, or similar? Um, can, you give a, uh, can you give a more specific example of what you mean by, uh, where, other yeah, than- example, Monthly composites, uh, of, of sentinel images for example for uh, for certain places uh so we have i don't know that we would do monthly composites at a i'll say that as two separate questions um 
we have talked about doing Sentinel composites specifically. Sentinel is actually really difficult to do monthly composites of because you don't get that many passes. And like, there's a lot of places in the world where you just can't get monthly composites. We have we are considering doing quarterly Sentinel composites um, because for a lot of like land cover mapping applications, seasonal composites are, are a really good foundation. We that's not quite on the radar yet, so I wouldn't expect that in the next couple of months. Um, but that is probably the most other than products. That's probably the most opinionated composite we would likely create. Now we do, of course, host third party products that are either that are regional. You know, we host a number of regional land cover products you know we have the u.s national land cover database and we are onboarding the australian national land cover data set so we're not restricted to global data sets we certainly host regional data sets that are typically produced by uh regional organizations in terms of data that the like novel data that we produce or commission i think in the area of what you described quarterly sentinel 2 composites would be the most likely and we wouldn't do that for other data sets that would be pretty unique to sentinel 2 um but I'm interested in your feedback on the scenarios where you'd use that. That's sort of somewhere on our roadmap right now, but probably not in the next three months, more like in the maybe three to six month time frame. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Cool. Any other data questions? Moving on then. So if we do all the things we just said, which is great, and that was a lot of work, it gets us to a super slick pile of files, which of course is not enough because uh, most of our users don't want a list of files in Azure Blob Storage. They want analysis-ready pixels for whatever regions and times they care about. Uh, which brings us to the second component of our Planetary Computer platform, uh, our Planetary Computer APIs, and in particular, our core API, which is our spatiotemporal querying API. Because as you know, basically 100% of people working with this kind of geospatial data, the first thing they're going to do is run a query for the ROI they care about. Find me all the Sentinel-2 images from Wyoming in 2019, or find me all the Landsat images from Wyoming in 2012, that kind of query. We need to support that efficiently, and we need to support that consistently over a wide variety of data types. We want you to be able to use the same syntax to query remote sensing data from a region in time that you might then use to query uh, biodiversity observation data, even those are very different data sets. Uh, and so that is the foundation of our Planetary Computer API. For those of you who are familiar with the stack uh, specification, our API is built entirely around stack. And so we've been working really closely with the stack community to both implement a stack based API and also really grow and expand the stack standard which very much grew up around remote sensing data, but we really want to help the community make it work for a lot of data sets beyond just remote sensing data, like land cover data and biodiversity observation data and weather data. Uh, so we've been working uh, closely with the stack community. And if you go take a look at our APIs, you'll see that we have a stack collection for each of the data sets we host, whether they are remote sensing or not. Um, I will dem I'm also going to give a demo later so you'll get a better feel of what our API looks like. but. Any questions about the nature of our API here? Moving on then, and I am going to do a demo, FYI. So then you'll really get, get a look at our API. Uh, so if we do all the things I just said now, now we have a super slick pile of files that's also easy to query, which is also great, uh, but still not enough since if you actually queried all the Landsat images from Wyoming in 2012, that would be a lot of data. Uh, and what which would then require a lot of compute power to do anything with. And whatever important analysis you were doing in Wyoming, we would like you to be able to scale that analysis globally because you know I think we all know that lots of analyses get stuck at a particular region because that is what the grad student who was working on them had time or funding to do. And we really want to facilitate the scaling of those analyses to, to global scale. Which brings us to the last component of our Planetary Computer platform, which we call the Planetary Computer Hub. This is a uh, managed computing environment that we run, of course, in the Azure Data Center where all that data is hosted. This is a uh, Jupyter Lab front end, so it's based entirely on familiar open source tools. We offer both uh, Python and R images. We are definitely we have a Python bias, uh, but we are growing our gradually growing our R support as well. So if you log in, you will definitely see uh, R and Python images within our computer environment. Of course, you have access to our planetary computer data and APIs, but Really, what makes our Jupyter Lab, our Jupyter Hub, uh, 
distinct is that it is connected to a distributed computing cluster that users have access to without having to get into the nuts and bolts of uh, exactly how that works. For those of you who are familiar with the Pangeo community, we basically borrowed our whole methodology from the Pangeo community and work very closely with them. So the tools we use are Jupyter, we use Dask and X-Array for our distributed computing. And again, you'll see a demo of that in a second. Um, in fact, you'll see a demo of that right now. I will pause very briefly to take any questions about the nature of our Planetary Computer Hub. Otherwise, I will flip over and show it to you. Uh, one question mm -hmm. from my side. Uh, yes. Is the only way to access Planetary Computer uh, the Jupyter interface, or are there also other uh, access options available? Great question. Glad you asked. So uh, one thing that is actually very important to us, like in the design of the Planetary Computer, you may there are many scenarios where you just want to use our data and you don't want to use our APIs or our hub. And that's great. You are a planetary computer to us, whether you're using, the data is the heart of the planetary computer. And so if you're using our data directly from blob storage or you're using Esri tools to access our data, or you're using another stack like Open Data Cube to access our data, that's great. You're a planetary computer user. If you're using just our data and APIs in an application and you have no interest in our hub, that's great. You're you are also a planetary computer user to us. Uh, and what that means in practice, by the way, is that if you go to the documentation for any of our data sets, like you go to the Sentinel-2 page on our catalog, you will see documentation of the Sentinel-2 collection in our planetary computer API. You will also just see documentation of what the structure is in blob storage, as if our API didn't exist, so that you can use all this, again, as long as you are operating in that Azure data center, you can access this via our Planetary Computer API, via our Hub and API, or via whatever tools you are accustomed to working with. Um, and that, that's actually an important design principle to us. So the Hub is, I'll call it our kind of first party blessed data science environment for working with our APIs and our data. But we strongly, we encourage people. And in fact, we expect many people will do their data science work in the Hub, but of course, JupyterLab is not a way to build applications. We anticipate that the vast majority of our users who are do, either who aren't doing scientific work or who have finished the scientific phase of their work will not be using our hub. They'll be, they may or may not be using our APIs at all, but really making the data accessible on Azure is the heart of the Planetary Computer. We do, although, so we, um, the only other tools, for example, that we have a hand in maintaining are that we do maintain we work with Esri to maintain Esri image servers for a couple of the data sets that we host so that Esri users can access this data also. Um, but we look forward to growing that too so that we're working closely with the Open Data Cube community so that Open Data Cube tools can be stood up nicely on top of our data and APIs. So we like our hub, we hope people like our hub, but we also hope people use lots of other tools. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, so let's do a little bit of a demo. Um, in this demo, I am going to produce a very poor cloudless mosaic from Sentinel-2 data. If, for those of you, I bet there's people in this room who know way more about cloudless mosaic creation than I do. Do not use the methods I'm about to show you for creating cloudless mosaics. That's not the point. The point is just to demonstrate how one accesses uh, uh, data through our APIs from our hub and how we scale your compute with Dask. So, um, I, this is our Planetary Computer Hub environment. Again, for anybody who's working in Jupyter Lab, this will look like a pretty vanilla Jupyter Lab environment. The first thing I'm going to do, though, is create a little Dask cluster for myself. I would think of it as in this cell when I'm creating this Dask cluster, which is just going to take a couple seconds. Um, it's like I'm getting a little compute grant from Microsoft. Uh, I have a little URL now that I can open that will point me to my Dask monitor. We'll open that up and come back to it later. Um, I now have a little compute cluster that I can use without uh, any particular changes to what I'll have to do in my code to now scale that my compute over a whole bunch of nodes that uh, Microsoft is managing for me. We're now going to uh, use our stack API to query for our, set, our region of interest from our Sentinel-2 data. I'm here in Redmond, Washington. Technically, I'm in Bellevue, but most of Microsoft is in Redmond. So uh, I'm going to define a ROI. And I'm going to use our stack API here to search for all data between January 2018 and December of 2020 from the Sentinel tool collection with cloud cover less than 
uh, and I got 107 scenes back. Of course, you can see that it's relatively straightforward to change these parameters to query for other data sets. And importantly, the collections you can use here are not just remote sensing data. I mentioned that we are working really hard with, this, with the stack community to make sure this query does will do sensible things for other data sets that weren't necessarily what stack could grow up around. Um, so we have 107 scenes here. I am going to render one of them. And the reason I'm rendering one of those scenes is, again, I really do want to make the point that this URL here is just a URL to a file on Azure Blob Storage that represents one of those scenes. And if you don't want to use our hub or any of our tools, this is a cog file that is compatible with lots of open source tools for working with geospatial imagery um, and acts just as it as a regular file on blob storage. You can mount this container and use it from other tools. Um, and so I just wanted to make the point that these are actual real files uh, on Azure Blob Storage. Uh, and I'll also make the point that there are there are in fact some clouds here. And we're going to go create a cloud with mosaic. So hopefully below when we look at our mosaic, we won't see these clouds here uh, over the lake. Okay. So uh, now we're going to um, uh, go ahead and create a uh, X-ray data set that is X-ray, again, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Pangeo toolkits, X-ray is a, uh, a in-memory representation that, of uh, geospatial data cubes that allows that plays nicely with distributed computing tools and makes it pretty straightforward to chunk that data set up and parallelize it over a number of um, a uh, number of nodes. I have a request to ink, zoom in so people can see better. Better? I'll assume it's better. Um, so I am creating an X-ray data set that represents all of those uh, scenes I just queried from my Sentinel-2 data. So you'll see I have 107 scenes. I have chosen the red, green, and blue bands from each of them. So my data cube is three axes on this side. And each of my Sentinel scenes is 1100 pixels by 1100 pixels. So I have this very large X-ray data set. I haven't actually loaded anything from disk yet. I have just created a virtual data set that points out to my disks. I'm going to tell it data persist means once I load you, keep this around in distributed memory for a while because I'm going to do a couple of operations on you. This is the part of this notebook where all the magic happens. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to now compute the uh, a very simple median composite. That's my fancy cloud-free composite. Again, this is not a demonstration of smart cloud-free composite techniques. Uh, I am going to compute the a uh, median image over all those 107 images. Um, and when I ran this cell, this will take a couple minutes, so I'll take questions. But if I flip over to my desk, uh, dashboard now. This is the URL that we got earlier when I created my desk cluster. You can see that a whole bunch of nodes are now uh, processing a whole bunch of scenes for me to compute, a whole bunch of chunks for me to compute that, uh, that median. Um, and I didn't have to get into the nuts and bolts of managing each one of these nodes. I'm just relying on Dask and X-Array to figure out a good way to distribute this computation over lots and lots of nodes. Um, and this will take about um, two to five minutes. And as you can imagine, this would take a whole lot longer if I had to do this on a single node. Um, and so I will therefore pause for a second and take any questions. And if there's no questions, I'll flip back to my slides for just a second while this thinks. Any hub questions? Yeah, I'm curious, but it's not a hub question. Fine, uh, far away. This, this visualization of X-Array, uh, this uh, 3D block, uh, how did you make it? That is native to X-Ray. That's part of the X-Ray toolkit. Part of X-Ray? Okay. It, yep. Yep. If you just print out an X-Ray in Jupyter Lab, that's what it looks like. I mean, I, I should say, you know, we work really closely with all of these communities, and uh, Tom from our team, who really maintains our hub, is actively involved in the development of X-Ray. So maybe Tom did or didn't have a hand in some of the pixels you see here, but basically this is native to X-Ray. Okay. Uh, desk array. Sorry? Oh, X-Ray or desk array? X-Ray. Okay, X-Array like. is, uh, is an open source environment for managing data cubes like this. It, is, it plays very nicely with Dask, though. It is built to work well with, distributed, with distributing operations using Dask. But it is not. You, you can use X-Ray without Dask. Yeah, that's what I do. Thanks.
Uh, I see the hand of Petra. Petra, do you want to ask a question? Yeah. Hello, my name is Petra. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, you have created a very nice uh, platform. How many users can you uh, allow? Good question. Actually, that's a great reminder that one of the slides I forgot to put in this deck is how you actually request access to this. So first I'll tell you that and then I'll answer your question. So anybody who's interested in what you see here, if you go to the Planetary Computer webpage, planetarycomputer.microsoft.com, there is a request access button at the top. Just go fill out that form. And then importantly, also email us, either me, I'm Dan, you'll see my email address at the end of this, email planetarycomputer at microsoft.com or dan at microsoft.com and say, I saw Dan speak at this ITC thing and I requested an access, I requested access to the planetary computer. Can you please approve my a request? And we will, but we'll miss it if you don't also email us. So go to the planetary computer website, request access, and then email us to say you saw my talk and you want access. And, and yeah, well, my real question is how many users can you accommodate? That's right. I think, so I think what you're asking is how many users can the hub accommodate? Because yes. the, the, you know, the API scales really well. Um, and I, the real answer is we don't know because actually even with a couple thousand registered planetary computer users, um, we've basically been gradually bumping up the size of the hub as we go. Um, I think if we had hundreds of simultaneous users, actually even more specifically, we can, uh, many, many, many users using single nodes will not be a problem. The real question I think you're asking is for operations like what I'm doing right now, where I'm actually reserving a whole bunch of nodes on Dask, how many users can we accommodate? And I would say if we had more than, I'm really guessing here because we really haven't, we're only a few months old and it's just, we haven't yes. had that many times when you know hundreds of people were using the, we're literally running Dask operations at the same time. I would say we would struggle if we went beyond hundreds. Um, but, yeah. and, and unfortunately, you know, it's good news that it hasn't come up. Um, um, it's good news that it hasn't come up yet. Um, the but but you are right to point out that the reality is this is a shared compute resource and there is a limit to how much it can uh, provide and a yeah, limit and it, it will impact performance, which is important because you know as per the question I was asking a minute ago, I was discussing a minute ago, another the hub itself is open source, and we really do encourage partners and we we have. We have uh, just last week, in fact, launched, we, we open sourced the hub configuration, including scripts to deploy your own an identical hub on Azure. The main reason being that, by a known participant, the main reason being that for many of, you know, we work with the science community and the conservation community. We also work with Microsoft customers who are actually generally perfectly willing to pay for their compute and don't want to wait in line for shared compute resources behind the scientific community. And we want to make sure there's a path to doing that for any number of reasons. And so what we do encourage people to do, if the hub can't provide the compute you need, either because just the ceiling is too low or because it's a shared resource and other people are using it, we want to make it as easy as possible for people to stand up identical hubs but in in the same Azure region and still use our data and APIs. And so you'll see if you go to the Planetary Computer website, you'll see scripts and templates for deploying your own hub that looks just like this one. Thank you. More than enough. I, uh, next question was, uh, what is the advantage of your platform over Google Earth Engine? Uh, so I'd say the main difference, you're right that there are many similarities. If you stand like a million feet away, they're both data catalogs with APIs and compute environments. Obviously, there's some design differences about preferred language and what the, what mm -hmm. the APIs and compute environment look like. And also, honestly, Google Earth Engine has a lot of features that we just don't have yet. Google Earth Engine is, is a much more, in many ways, a more mature platform that's been around a while. Uh, I think the main difference is that Google Earth Engine is a very vertically integrated environment, and they can you can do amazing things in Earth Engine from within the Earth Engine environment. And in fact, you can, they can do optimizations that we will never be able to do because we've made this very different decision to make all those files available as just files on Azure Blob Storage. If you yeah. don't want to work in our environment or you do some science in our environment and then want to deploy that as an application, we want you to be able to just work with files in any stack you want. Leave the hub, never use the hub. We, that comes at a price. That's not because like we did magic and like, you know, we're we're smarter than Google. That's not the case. It's actually that we have made a design decision 
to make things available in a familiar file format on Azure Blob Storage so you can use it from any number of environments. And that's just a different trade off than Earth Engine made. Um, so okay. That's probably the I major think, differentiator. Uh, Plus, like, yes. Some people may like different aspects of one environment versus another. Yeah, thank you. Do we have one other hand up a minute ago? Going once. Yeah, I saw the hand of Ankit, yes. Yeah, so I, I have a question about the different data sets. So um, just to understand it, right? So XRA only handles raster data, which is uh, some kind of a NumPy kind of format. Uh, how, how do you deal with different kind of vectors and so many other different data types? Uh, I don't have a one size fits all answer for that, unfortunately. We don't, so you are right that there's an easy answer here, which is a lot of, you know, especially for like machine learning type analyses, a lot of those will go through a rasterization process that then makes them natural fits to X-ray. Um, we, if you look at these kind of example notebooks, for example, for some of our non-vector data sets, although most of our data sets, particularly most of our very large data sets, are our raster data set, our remote sensing data, the raster data, X-ray is a really natural fit. So you'll see those in the example notebooks for most of our data sets. We don't have a one size fits all answer, but we have recommended tools that are sort of bespoke per data type. Uh, you know, we have tabular data that we store in parquet format, like biodiversity data. We have a couple of biodiversity data sets and we, we don't have a one size fits all answer. My best answer is go look at the example notebooks for some of our non raster data sets. Um, and we haven't necessarily, we have not, uh, I'll say blessed, a particular toolkit for working with non-raster data the way we have for raster data because the integration between, because we had to configure a cluster and make some decisions about what that was. And by choosing Dask, it sort of was choosing Dask and X-Ray at the same time. So we've made a very integrated decision about how we recommend doing your computation for raster data. I think we've provided some good example options, but we haven't done anything quite that integrated yet for the vector and tabular data that we host. Kind of okay. a non-answer, but the best, but but we do have data like that and go check out the example notebooks to see uh, what we're doing and, uh, and what we're recommending. Thanks, I'll check it out. Okay, while we were talking, that went exactly the way I hoped it would. Our median composite finished and now we have a RGB by one Sentinel scene uh, median composite image. So we will plot our image. As you can see, this is snow, not a cloud. The clouds were over here in the previous image, and now we have a cloud-free composite. Again, I stress we have not solved hard problems in Mosaic creation, but we have done a pretty large computation without having to get into the nuts and bolts of distributed computation. So a lot of computation just happened over some couple dozen nodes uh, from that one line of median computation here. And again, I attribute a lot of that to just the hard work that the Pangeo and X-ray communities have put in uh, because a, a lot of work is baked into this median.compute line. Um, and one of the great benefits of leveraging open source tools, uh, aside from other people being able to create their own hubs, like I said, is that that is all an amazing amount of code that we did not have to write because we're working closely with the open source community. Um, I will do one more little demo. I'm also gonna use uh, X-ray to compute monthly uh, composites from that same time series. So I'm gonna group that data by month. Um, this is all, again, tools that are all already built into X-Ray. This should be a smaller, a faster computation now because that data for the most part was persisted in memory the first time. Uh, so that went very quickly because all the data was read from disk when I did my one size fits all composite. And so now I have a 12 months by RGB by Sentinel tile uh, composite and I can render each of those. There we go. And it turns out that it's snowier, snowier in Seattle in the winter than it is in the summer. Um, and I will flip back to slides now. Um, any other hub questions? I have a few questions, but maybe sure. I will ask them at the end. Sure, I'm almost done. Well, we'll do, we, I think I have two more slides. So. Okay. Uh, so if we do all the things we just said, we have a hub, we have data, we have APIs. Now we have a super slick pile of files. It's easy to query and we have lots of power to compute over it, which is still not enough since ultimately our goal is to support environmental decision makers 
who don't care about anything I've said in this talk. They don't care about Jupyter Lab. They don't care about blob storage. They don't care about analysis ready pixels or atmospheric correction. Uh, they want decision support tools for uh, sustainability questions. And this is why we are working with partners to actually build applications that put all of these things to work. This is largely where the line between Microsoft first party work and our partner third party work is. Um, you can go to the URL at the bottom, plantechcomputermicrosoft.com applications to see a bunch more, but I've put a few on this slide to give you a feel for the types of applications that we are supporting with the planetary computer and really give you a feel for why we're doing all of this. Uh, so we've worked, for example, with uh, Development Seed to uh, build an AI accelerated land use and land cover assessment tool. Uh, we've worked with uh, an NGO called Amazon to build a deforestation risk analysis tool for the Amazon that uses Landsat data from the planetary computer. Uh, and we worked with a carbon plan to uh, build a tool that uses climate and fire risk models and data that's hosted on the planetary computer to help better prioritize forest-based carbon offset projects in the US. Um, kind of gives you a feel for why we're doing all this. You'll see a few more on our applications page. And again, we're still only six months old, so hopefully there are many, many more of these coming. And I will stop there now and take any questions about the planetary computer, or as I mentioned, I'm happy to take questions about our AI for uh, biodiversity surveys work, even though it's not necessarily today's topic. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, so, yeah, the questions are coming. So, um, William asks, are results of the computations persistence on the hub? He's asking. Um, you, the you, hub, uh, hub, they are shared nodes. So, hub memory is recycled when you are idle for a while. Uh, you have a home direct. The, the most common paradigm, I think, in the hub or in Jupyter Lab in general, is you have a home directory on Jupyter Hub and you can write stuff there. That is. Uh, limited in its in the volume. I don't actually remember what the number is. I think it's like 20 gigs of space in your home directory. It's, some, it's tens of gigabytes in your home directory. If that's not enough, the typical paradigm that we would use, that we use, for example, when we do use large computations, is to stand up your own Azure uh, blob container and write data out to your to Azure blob storage. And we have examples on our Planetary Computer documentation of, you know, if you compute an in-memory result that's a terabyte and you want to write it out to Azure Blob Storage. That's typically what we would do. And we give you examples for how to do that. And we may happily give you an AI for Earth grant. Again, I mentioned we're a grants program too. So it's very common that like, I, I need to pay for some storage during my project. Can you give me an AI for Earth grant to do that? We may very well do that. Even though that's sort of outside of the hub, we may give you an AI for Earth grant to pay for some storage that, so that you have enough space to write out your one terabyte result. Um, but I guess the important question is if you just compute stuff in memory and then you like walk away for a week, that that will be gone. So you do need to uh, be conscious of persisting results in Jupyter uh, in general, but certainly on our planetary computer hub. We have at least one hand up. Yes, Thomas. Uh, yeah, thanks, Dan, for, for the very interesting talk. And uh, especially, I uh, like the opening and uh, the closing where it said is uh, for biodiversity monitoring these kind of applications. Uh, I mean, I have a bit of a technical interest, but my key interest is indeed the I final use. And you also talked about your own hobby, which is camera traps, right? And uh, which I actually am involved in a project at the moment as well. And what I've seen so far is the AI used there is to detect the species, right? To kind of determine it. But we're actually in this project also very interested, would it be possible to determine their uh, movement speed and perhaps even their size? And I was wondering if, if you have any experience with that and if there's ways to uh, work with this. Uh, ah, I see already a link that I should follow, but. <laughs> well, that, so that, that is a link to most of our camera trap work. I will say, in fact, most of our camera trap work isn't even at the species classification level. The work that we do primarily is specifically to help ecologists sort images that are empty versus animals versus vehicles and people because that is such a huge time sink for most of our ecologists yeah. and species classification like there is amazing literature it's still really hard in practice it's it's still it's a still nearly it's not quite where one would like it to be for real applications there's actually not very many applications yet where ai accelerated species classification has really worked its way into the camera trap literature or into camera trap practice um some but not a ton. Yep. So most of our success has come from just helping people get rid of their 99% empty images, because then at that point, like the space classification is almost isn't even worth it because you've already saved 99% of your time. That's the goal. 
Um, in terms of getting beyond species classification, I say that to some extent not to discourage you, but to realize that even species classification is still pretty difficult. Um, in terms of movement analysis or behavior analysis, you know, I'm not familiar. Um, yeah, we'd have no problem finding and even classifying that animal for the cases where we have a species classifier. Um, so I'm not familiar with anything specifically on automated okay, yeah. movement or behavior analysis, but a couple a couple tidbits. So if you wanted to experiment, the model we use, even for separating empty from non-empty images, is actually an object detection model. So you do get bounding boxes for the animals it finds. So okay, if you yeah. are operating on animals that we perform well on, like large terrestrial megafauna, you would get reliable bounding boxes. And if it's not like a huge herds, like let's take that image, for example, and you wanted to know how fast that animal was crossing that image, you'd have a very reliable measure of that from the bounding boxes. Now you have a lot of other work to do to figure out how far away it is and like what that actually means. So we have a tool that is sort of useful to you, but there's a lot of work left to do. The only group that I'm familiar with, I'm happy to introduce you after the call. There is a group uh, at uh, ZSL, the, or ZSL, as I think everyone says in Europe. I mean, us funny Americans say ZSL, ZSL to everyone else, uh, that is looking at so, exactly yeah. that, using camera traps, to uh, to measure animal movement speed and to an extent to estimate the distance from the camera. I think they may have had stereo camera pairs set up yeah, to try yeah. to some ground truth. I'm happy to do an introduction. That's the deepest work I'm familiar with. It's really yeah, trying yeah, to- I mean, I mean, the way we set them up now, we have actually a few recognition points with no distance and we try to kind of, but I think it'll be still quite some manual labor. So I thought if you have any, any specific tools that could operate even in this cloud environment, that would of course be fantastic then. And then yeah, perhaps our follow up question is, is, are there ways to upload your data then? Because of course, there We've got our camera traps. We have to uh, uh, download the data, and then somehow, you know, it needs to be made available to the cloud computing platform. So, is there sure. other ways to upload your own information into this whole stack that you already have there? There is. First of all, I just want to clarify for everybody. I'm yeah. definitely going to answer this question. I love talking about this. This is really not related to the planetary computer. So, what I the answers I'm about okay, to give. Yeah, to yeah. Yeah. No, no. It's, it's, I just whatever I'm about to say about uploading. That's not how I would actually write, like that's not related to the planetary computer. So I, I just want to be clear that when I talk about uploading, it's, it's not, it's just different stuff. Yeah. Um, so yes, we do have the tools we have, I think may be worth trying. Like if you had bounding boxes on those animals, now you have a different problem that you can try to experiment with. I do recommend you try that. Um, yeah. You can email us at camera traps at microsoft.com to, to learn more. Yeah. And basically, so we do, we, we, incur, we, we help users run our model locally if they want to. But for many of our users, especially our less technical users, they're not really going to run like a TensorFlow model locally. And so we we do help people upload and we just typically create a storage container for them and send them just really, just send them instructions for command line upload of a whole folder to Azure storage. Then we run the images through our model and send them back results. We're happy to do that here. We often do that to get started, even with our highly technical users. We're just like, let us do it once so that if it's actually doesn't work very well, you don't waste your time learn learning how to run our tools and then if it works well then we'll show you how to run it on your own so that the next 10 times you do it you're not dependent on us that's really common so i'm happy if you email camera traps at microsoft.com we're happy to run a test batch see if those and then you can look at those bounding boxes and be like would these make it easier for us to estimate animal size animal movement if you know the animal and now you have the size of the bounding box like if they're mostly adults, that sort of tells you the distance from the camera. So you can, if yeah, you average yeah. over enough images, you can you can ask some questions from bounding boxes. Yeah. Great. Thanks a lot for that explanation, Dan, and uh, for the invitation. So you might hear more from us. Thanks. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe we can organize another meeting for camera traps. Uh, it looks like it can be nice. Um, I have some questions actually, but if there are no questions from the audience, um, I want to ask Dan because uh, we, at ITC we have also a small version um, um, of a similar platform. And I want to ask you the three uh, most frequently asked questions that we receive. And the first one is whether you have GPU support for machine learning. Um, and the second one, um, if somebody needs to, to, to use the platform for extended duration, so if they want to train a model, for example, is there a limitation? How can they do that? Uh, as long as they keep the web browser open, that is fine. But uh, is there a better way? 
um, to do yep, that. Understood. So, yeah. um, you, so this, you asked two questions. Uh, the first, so, so if you log into the Punching Computer Hub, you will see. Actually, I'll tell you all as of today. I think there's five different images you can choose from. There is the one I used for today. You, I, that's the one thing I did ahead of this talk is I went in and because it can take a couple minutes, so I, I created my my Jupyter Lab node before this talk. Uh, there's the regular Python CPU image. There's an R image, also CPU based. There is a, a QGIS image, which is literally QGIS running in your browser. That's also CPU based. And then there are two GPU images, one with uh, PyTorch tools pre-installed and one with TensorFlow tools pre-installed. Um, so yes, you can go and use them. Those are an even more share scarce resource because those aren't easily shareable among users. We can pack lots of users onto a, a CPU virtual machine. That's essentially you, you own the GPU for as long as you have that node. Um, so when those are available, you can definitely, and again, this is one of the reasons we make it easy for people to stand up their own hub because if that is a good experience for you, it may very well be the case that you log in again next week and none of those GPUs are available. And so we want to make it easy for you to do that on your own if you want to. So yes, there is GPU support, but it is a shared resource, so it's first come, first serve. And it's the same answer in the second part. So you are right that right now, the tools we have are very much meant for synchronous operation, basically while your browser is open. And that's true of, of the Planting Computer Hub and really most of the Pangeo toolkit. One of the things we're working on over, I'd say, the next six months is a batch processing workflow where you would submit jobs, close your browser, and then be notified when your job is done. Um, so that's coming. Although we also, like, again, one of the, I stress that really one of the main reasons we, you don't have to use our hub. And we have a million examples and a million different ways of using other tools on Azure to achieve the same result. And we will happily give a lot of people Azure credits to do those things. So there may be some scenarios where the right answer is, if that's actually what you want to do, don't use our hub right now. And we're, ha we're happy to encourage people, like tell people when the hub is the wrong environment and still use our data in APIs. You're Like I said, you're still a planetary computer user to us if that's your environment. So we'll work with users to help figure out what the right toolkit is. But like we do a lot of work in Azure Batch, for example, outside of the hub. Of course, we do all kinds of, you know, we just stand up a VM and train models on GPUs on a virtual machine. Um, and we are using our planetary computer APIs and data, and we're happy to help users do that too outside of our hub. Eventually, I think the hub will be better for that than it is right now. Uh, but if you needed to have a really long running model training session, for example, the hub may not be the right environment for that right now. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Okay, then uh, I have two additional questions. Uh, the, the, the first one is, um, as you mentioned, it is under development. And I can imagine that there are some features which are not publicly available, but maybe uh, in fact uh, available on the platform uh, for, for selected people. So do you foresee like a early, um, a beta testing or uh, that kind of partnership uh, program which people might be interested? I would say that the whole planetary computer is a beta testing program right now. So <laughs> like we, we are definitely in preview and still young. And so we try to, we roll things out when we are fairly confident they're stable, but like there's a lot left to learn. And so we are like, if you read the language, we're very clear that like some stuff might not work because we're still definitely working with the community to, get like for example and, and even some of the images i just referred to you'll see when you log into the planetary computer hub are definitely tagged as even more preview than the other than the other than the rest of the planetary computer so the tensorflow image is brand new the QGIS image is brand new um so we don't have like a separate we are constantly rolling out new features that are hopefully non-disruptive to existing features we don't have a separate pool of users to whom we expose those as soon as we roll something out Obviously, we have an internal staging area, so we see all the bugs first. We fix a bunch of bugs, as many as we can find, and then we do roll those out to make them make those new features, like new images, available uh, to uh, the to all Planetary Computer users. Um, and we do sort of quarterly updates to our web page and by email to tell people of what new features are available. And some people help us find bugs, and we try to fix them. <laughs> okay, thank you. 
Um, and my qu last question is actually uh, the relation between AI for Earth and planetary computers. So in, in the past, uh, there were some grantees uh, of AI for Earth program from ITC. And as far as I know right now, also we have the grantees. Um, and partly it is really competitive. So it is partly, uh, yeah, uh, um, you need to have good ideas. So eventually to be a grantee. So um, do you foresee like a, a facilitated way um, um, if, if, you, if the project indicates, for example, the use of um, planetary computer for the, for the project, or if the project is itself like a producing a data set which can be hosted um, at planetary computer. So do you, do you see this, uh, this is something feasible? Yeah, so I would divide our grants into two broad categories. We have always had our Azure only grants that are just Azure credits. Those are typically five to fifteen thousand dollars in Azure credits, and then we have our and and our Azure grants are entirely administered by Microsoft. You go to our application portal and you apply for Azure grants. Then we also have our cash and Azure credit grants, which we typically administered in the past with an external organization. So we've done RFPs with National Geographic, with GeoBon, and most recently with Geo. For that. Our Azure Grants program right now hasn't changed. If you apply for an Azure Grant now, it will the process and the grants which we give will look very much like they did before. We don't, that is to say, we will continue to give Azure Grants to things that don't have anything to do with the planetary computer. That's fine. Our cash grants, like the only RFP we have open right now is with GEO and is very specific to the planetary computer. So our grants program in that sense is definitely aligned now to the planetary computer either for organizations using the planetary computer or as you suggested for organizations uh, producing data that would benefit the community if we made it available on the planetary computer. But definitely, and I see that definitely being the trend going forward that we are unlikely to do RFP based cash grants now that are not related to the planetary computer. Our Azure grants program, I think is a little more open-ended where we may continue to provide Azure credits for folks doing non-geospatial work. Uh, but our certainly the only open RFP we have right now, and the only one really we've had open all year this year, uh, are pretty tightly integrated with the planetary computer now. Okay, thank you. And you mentioned also the partners, right? So um, um, is there a specific uh, procedure uh, to be a partner or how, how does it work? Definitely more organic. Those are the, the they come from all different sources. Some of them they, they, they are partners we have engaged from a variety of different means. Um, so there's not exactly a single system for, for example, the folks that you'll see who have built applications that are listed on the Planet Computer Applications page. Um, there's a much there's not the same like structured RFP process uh, mm -hmm. for those. Um, we are always looking for applications, particularly applications that go beyond science and into sustainability practice that put planetary computer tools, data and tools to work for sustainability practice. We are always looking for partners and have funding available to build those applications. Typically, the first engagement there is not so much with the developer, but the engagement starts with a stakeholder. It's not, it, it varies a little bit, but like rarely there we're looking for um, applications that can impact conservation stakeholders right now. Sometimes the conservation stakeholder and the developer are the same person. Sometimes we work with a conservation stakeholder and then bring in a third party developer. But we are definitely, I would say those are basically at the most applied end of our grants program. And um, But there's not exactly the same structured path that we have for our more science-based grants that go definitely go through RFPs. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think we, our time is almost over, so uh, if there will be a final question, we can take it. Otherwise, I want to thank thank you, Dan, uh, for this very nice talk and information about the planetary computer. Um, I want to invite everybody uh, to to try it. Uh, so uh, yeah, there is a registration pr procedure, but um, it will it is really pre pre pretty quick. 
Um, so please have a look and a, a try. Uh, and, and don't I, forget I'm, to email us after you after you request access, or we will miss it. Planetary computer at Microsoft.com. Just yeah. email us and say, I saw Dan's talk, and please give me access, and we will. Yeah, that, that's the trick to make the things faster. And, and uh, well, I hope to uh, see you again, Dan, about uh, the Camera Trap. Topic. Please. So, so it, it was very clear that you like to talk about it, and it, it, it is already so. We have people also working on this and having uh, challenges, in, in fact, um, about it. So it can be really nice uh, to organize a meeting also on the topic. Um, Anytime. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the, the the slides and also read the recording will be shared uh, later, so you will also have access um, to it. Thank you very much. So. Thanks, Bye-bye.